Jim, our next question sent on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through is from Slovakia99. Is that the name or the city or the zip code or? All of the above, I believe. I recently listened to Kurt Angle talking about the reverse ladder match in TNA. Oh, boy. What were your thoughts on such a weird match? And I have here a screen capture of the rules from Slammiversary, the tale of the tape. I was, I was about to say, if you if you can read those again, because this was more of shit stain stuff. He decides, since he does everything backwards anyway. Remember, they had a, a reverse battle royal where everybody started on the floor and the object was to get into the ring. And they have, everything that he would come up with was just stealing a match that already existed and doing it backwards from back to front instead of front to back. But go ahead with those rules. Five men compete for the TNA World Championship. The object, climb the ladder to hang the championship belt. (laughs) You are only eligible to climb the ladder after you gain a pinfall or submission win. The wrestler who is pinned or submits must spend the next two minutes in the penalty box. Yeah, and he stole the old (laughs) world-class Dallas wrestling penalty box match, too. The first man who hangs the belt is named the TNA World Heavyweight Champion. That seems overly complicated for no good reason. <laughs> and that's and Dutch Mantel came out and told me one time that's why they kept calling me to come to to remember after after OVW. It was the summer of two thousand five. I was burnt out on the wrestling business and not really interested in doing a lot. And Dutch starts calling me, hey, we're doing this thing in TNA down here in Orlando. We're shooting it, and blah, blah, blah. And this was before, that was before they got on Spike, I think. They definitely only had a one-hour show. And then I said, you know, I just, I don't, I don't, long story short, don't want to. Don't want to, I just finished this wrestling thing. I still have a piece of OVW. I'm selling advertising for the television show here. I'm just taking it easy. Don't want to go anywhere. But Dutch kept calling. Finally, the next year, th- that's when I think they got on Spike, and it was shortly before they got two hours. They were still an hour. But Dutch called, and and I said, okay, all right. That's when we decided to start doing that. He wanted to make me the authority figure, the wrestling czar, or whatever the case. And I got down there and and started off on that. But that's then, obviously, the story's been told. That's when Dixie, I didn't know, I blamed Jeff for a long time, but, but Dixie wanted shit stain back. And we're not going into that story now, but one of the byproducts was that Dutch said a couple months later, he said, that's another reason why we needed you in here, especially now, because who the fuck else? And when you think about it, Brian, I'm open to you pitching another name. Who the fuck else had the verbal ability to go out in one take in live in front of the crowd and explain to anybody, the fans and the wrestlers, what the rules were of these goddamn cockamamie matches that L. Shitstein was booking. I took it as a personal challenge because (laughs) the when we try to lay them out for the boys, they couldn't understand it. And I'm supposed to be telling the fans what the rules are of the, so they'll understand it and buy the pay-per-view. That's basically, that was my role in, in terms of when Dutch was on the creative team, he used me as the explainer in chief to explain the fucking stipulations of and reasons for the matches because nobody else could get it out in a coherent fashion. And I took it as a, as a challenge. And there was a few times that I, scrape the surface of not getting it out myself, but I don't think anybody else in the business could have done that. Without going too deep into your well-known issues with Vince Russo, when you were there and you were actually trying as hard as you can to be a good employee and be a good team player and not letting your issues with him get in the way, would at any point anyone, whether it's you or someone else, just try to say, hey, we know you're really into this, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. Here's why. Or was it just, he's going to do whatever he wants, no matter what, there's no talking him out of it? 
Well, it here was the thing. Nobody we're having a production meeting in TNA at, at, at the Universal Studios, right? For at a TNA taping. Who's in the production meeting? The agents, technically, whoever they were at the time, whether it was Savio Vega or Road Dog, Brian James, or Simon Diamond with Scott Demore, whoever the case, they technically worked for the creative team. They were the ones that were supposed to take what the creative team, you know, had envisioned and lay it out to the boys and produce it and et cetera, right? So they can't, they can ask questions or they can say, well, do you think that so-and-so or would it might be this way to do or whatever, but they can't really overrule anything. The announcers are in their own way very important to the show, but they can't overrule anything. The producer... Keith Mitchell, the director, whether it be Timmy Walbert or Dave Sahadi or whoever it may have been at the time, they have their, you know, area is television production. They can tell the camera people what to do and the audio and sound and all the grips and et cetera, but they can't change the creative. There were two people basically besides the people on the creative team in the room, one with the ability or the the ability to change the creative or the ability to question it. Jeff Jarrett, because he was the boss, and except for Dixie, he was the minority owner, and, and I always considered Jeff Jarrett the boss. I would have never gone to work for Dixie Carter, and I never did work for Dixie Carter. I waved at her every once in a while. I was working with Jeff Jarrett. Or me! Because even though I technically did not have the fucking power to... I was I was a producer, an agent, so technically I should be working for the creative team, but also I was the on-air authority figure. So technically, I was the fucking spokesperson for the company, and also, if I was going to go out and be involved in something on camera or try to tell guys how to do it when they were on camera, I either wanted to understand it inside and out or I wanted it to make as much sense as possible. And I was not in any way intimidated by bringing up out loud, and you can ask Mike Tanay about this, anything that Vince Russo did that didn't make any fucking sense. So I would be the one to say, uh, excuse me. <laughs> and then I would relate what didn't make sense in such a way that everybody would be sitting there going, yeah, that don't make a lick of fucking sense. And Russo hated it. Because... Nobody else wanted to get in the goddamn pissing contest with the skunk, but that's what I live for, especially when we're doing a wrestling television program that needs to be as good as it could be. So I was the one that would question everything, regardless of whether it was in my department or not, because Jeff Jarrett wanted me to, and so did Dutch Mantell. He didn't just want to come out and say it out loud. But they wanted me to because nobody else would fucking go face to face or nose to nose or whatever with Russo, they would just roll their eyes and fucking accept it because they didn't feel like they had the ability to question it. So that's what I would do. Every goddamn taping, every goddamn production meeting. And then it would be all sorted out by the time that we got out of there so we know what we were doing. Most of the time, my shit was either changed to what I had mentioned or there was some agreement made to meet in the middle but shit stain didn't like when any of his shit was monkeyed with in any way and that's where his problem came in and then he would go to dixie who was never at the she was in the production meeting sometimes which was like me listening to somebody speak in greek most times she wasn't in the production meeting she was floundering about at the hard rock cafe or whatever um <laughs> No, that is, that's where she stayed. She stayed at the Hard Rock Hotel, the big resort, with all the people that, you know, fetched and carried for her and fucking, you know, the expensive shit, whereas we were over at the Doubletree, parking in the lot and paying for our own parking. But anyway, he would, everybody would look to me to fix the shit. Either Mike Tanay, when he was reading it, <laughs> And they, then he would look to me when I, when he would see that I was about to raise my hand for a question. 
Uh, Jeff and Dutch encouraged it, wanted it because it made the program better. All the other agents wanted it because I was clarifying the job that they were supposed to be doing that they were confused about, but they either didn't want to fucking bog everything down in the meeting or they didn't want to fucking have to engage shit stain questioning his stuff. And so that's what, and then also I did it for the boys who weren't in the production meeting, but since I was the producer of most of the main events involving the top guys, they were the ones most likely to question what I was telling them and say, what the fuck is this supposed to be? And I would have to have either an answer for them that they could understand, or I would have had to change what was proposed to something that could be laid out that they would go for. Whether it was Booker T or, I mean, Samoa Joe and those guys were easy. Rude and Storm, those guys were easy. But the Booker T's and the Kevin Nash's and the Stings and the Kurt Angle sometimes of the world, they needed more detail and they wanted more input and they wanted more back and forth and they weren't shy about saying, this doesn't make any sense. Such as the story I related that one time when he laid out a match that had a finish, but it never started. And he's, ah, nobody's going to notice. And then the first thing that all the guys said when I laid it out to him was, wait a minute, the match never started. So we came up with a way to start it. But hold on. So he had a finish, but the match never started. You threw me yeah. off with the way you said that. I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah, no, it, it started out. It was just an interview. People were talking and then suddenly more people came out and then it just bro somehow broke out into a match. But it did. There was, <laughs> there was no bell to ring the match. They just started fighting and there was no thought to, well, we got to bring a referee out and we got to ring a bell. But then he put a finish in on the fight, a wrestling match finish to the fight. That's what I'm saying. Little details like that had to be ironed out. And again, and I'm not trying to put myself over as I was so much smarter than everybody in the room. I was just the only one in the room that A, had the, the pull or the ability. B, didn't give a fuck whether I had heat or not. Uh, C, definitely wanted to take every chance that I could to show people publicly that Shitstain didn't know what the fuck he was doing. And D wanted to make everybody's job easier. So that's why I was the one to speak up about it. And, and today, and that we just talked about Don West and thank everybody again that contributed Don West's GoFundMe for his brain cancer. But they got a big tickle out of it because it wasn't their, they couldn't say, they knew things. Mike Tanay especially knew this is ridiculous, but he, it wasn't his place to say anything. But I'd take care of it. I was trying to take care of the other agents, too, because they'd wander out of the room going, what the fuck does he want us to do? Well, Jim, when you look back on that period of time, it's amazing you kept any of the hair on your head. I'm telling you, you know, that, that period, the period of the three years that I worked for TNA ruined my hearing and lost me a lot of hair. All of the pyro in that little bitty broom closet of a soundstage I've got the tinnitus and constantly pulling my hair out of my head, trying to resolve these issues rather than taking a hatchet to old shit stain left me with a bald spot. If only I had known about our friends at keeps in time. Now folks, I'll tell you this two out of three men will experience some form of hair loss. By the time they're 35, more than 50 million men in the United States suffer from male pattern baldness. And as we've mentioned before, Hotchkiss and many of the male members of the Featherbottom family suffer from early onset male pubic baldness, which is even worse because you got to do that comb down of your stomach hair. But if you have any types of these hair losses, whether it's male pattern baldness or whether it's, it's the, the mange, because a lot of people, when they get the mange, they lose their hair or whether it's just you're pulling it out by the handfuls because you have to work with a buggy whip armed, obnoxious, bug-eyed idiot, you need to have Keeps on speed dial. Keeps, actually it's a dot com, it's not a phone number, but keep them right in your computer because Keeps, K-E-E-P-S dot com, is the place to go if you don't want the stress of leaving your hair. Convenient, 
leaving your hair, losing your hair, or leaving your hair, or if your hair leaves you, because you don't have to leave your home <laughs> because they've got virtual doctor consultations. Virtual doctor consultations means that you consult with them virtually rather than physically in person. And in some cases, it means that they're not quite a doctor, but all my, they're virtually a doctor, not really. But no, they got the good guys here. These people have all gone to some level of training that work with keeps, folks. Sometimes it's correspondence courses. Other times it's word of mouth on the party line. But they've got 24-7 care and support, a network of expert medical advisors, prescribers, and care specialists to support you in making your hair goals a reality. I'll tell you what, those hair goals, they're tough. Three-pointers are especially difficult because, especially in a good stiff breeze, that hair will blow off track. Folks, these Keeps treatments start at just $10 a month. They're low cost because Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved medications that prevent hair loss. And they've got generic versions of both of them, so they're not going to charge you out the ass. Conveniently, this is not... Either one of these medications is not the medication that continues to grow hair on your ass. They we're all talking about the top of your head here. Uh, typically half the cost of pharmacy prices. And I went in the other day and saw a pharmacist, and he was bald. So what does he know? Remember, folks, Keeps has everything your hair needs, except for scissors. And it's delivered straight to your door with discreet packaging and proven results. Plain brown wrappers, because of all the naughty, candid photography that comes inside. Anyway, when it comes to your hair, folks, save more and spend less if you're ready to take action and prevent your hair loss or the hair loss of a loved one near you. As a matter of fact, sometimes women just buy this shit, wait till they go to sleep, and just take a handful of it and smear it on their fucking head. They'll never even know. And that way you don't have to look at some egg-headed cue ball across from you at the breakfast table every morning. But whether you're using it on your own head or the head of someone you love, go to keeps.com, K-E-E-P-S dot com slash J-C-E to get your first month of treatment for free. Keeps.com slash J-C-E, first month of treatment for free. Brian, what would happen if you woke up in the middle of the night and Suzanne had a handful of stuff smearing it all over the top of your head? If it was keeps, I would be happy. Well, there you go. I guess See, it's a great thing for, for you to do to somebody. <laughs> but you shouldn't Just, do as it. As a matter of fact, you should no. not to do it to anyone if they're not aware of it. You should wait for someone to say, hey, I'd really like to utilize keeps. Well, no, you don't want to do that because then you've insulted people. You've said, look, you really need to do something to save all your hair because you're getting bald. Then you've made them. They, they feel bad. They're all self-conscious. Just. If your neighbor is bald, for example, buy some of this stuff, wait till he goes to sleep, sneak in his house, rub it on his head every night without waking him up. In in a couple of months, he's going to notice the difference and he's going to say, wow, look at my hair. It looks so good. And you're going to say, that's because I've been sneaking in your bedroom window every night, rubbing this glop that's on the top idea. of your head. You ought to thank me now. No, you shouldn't. And that's a bad idea. And don't sneak attack anyone with Keeps because Keeps is a wonderful product that people choose to use on their own and you could choose to use it right now. You know, you should have used it. Randy Savage would have changed his whole life. It would have it changed. And H Hogan too. Well, Savage, I feel like Savage had a tougher time overcompensating for the bald spot. Hogan was just bald. Savage just had a bowl on top. Well, and then Wahoo. Well, Wahoo then Wahoo, he used spray paint. Spray on hair paint, yeah. The Clive Davis treatment. That's right. He would he would he would sweat black in hot hot buildings. But uh, yes, keeps. Uh, just jump in. Just jump in your neighbor's bedroom window in don't, the middle of the night. No, don't smear jump some in of anywhere. this. Uh, don't. Well, you don't want to insult the guy and come out and tell him he needs hair products. You want to just just help him, but don't bring it out in the open and insult him about it. He'll feel self conscious. Just don't let him catch you. Don't let him catch you climbing in his bedroom window late at night unless you're a woman in which case then he would probably wouldn't <laughs> complain what if he thinks that you're having an affair with his wife and he shoots you well now that would be something to watch out for you definitely have to keep on your toes about that but if you're a woman climbing in the window well then he wouldn't even care if you're having an affair with his wife because he'd want to watch 
keeps.